good afternoon and uh, welcome to the second faculty talk organized by the robert bird center for data science and ai i am sridhar kumar narasimhan faculty in chemical engineering and also associate with this uh, center so uh, every quarter we plan to have series of talks given by faculty members associated with the center on their research problems uh, which have a significant data science and ai component so today we have uh, have three talks by professor geeta krishnan ramadurai professor ganpati krishnamurthy and for and the last one is by professor kartik raman so i'll give a very brief introduction about professor geeta professor geeta krishnan ramadurai is a professor in the transportation engineering De division department of civil engineering at iit madras he is a core faculty member in the robert bird center for data science and ai he received his btech in honors in civil engineering from iit roorkee ms in civil engineering from UT Austin in 2003 and PhD in transportation engineering from RPI in uh, June 2009 his overarching goal is to develop technological and management solutions for safe and sustainable transportation system his primary research interests are in network modeling dynamic traffic simulation assignment intelligent transport systems vehicular emissions urban freight public transport systems and road safety for his PhD work he was awarded the first prize in the uh, dissertation award by informs the transportation Lo science and logistics society section of informs he was received the new york metropolitan commission september 11 memorial program fellowship in 2007-8 he's authored several journal papers numbering and conference papers numbering over 65 he has worked on several publicly funded projects in uh, its intelligent transportation systems and urban uh, transportation he has advised several government agencies including chennai port trust jnpt kolkata port trust sitco navi mumbai on several occasions when you try to reach him he is in meeting either in secretariat or delhi advising our uh, transport officials uh, he has also worked significantly with chennai corporation tamil nadu police tnhsp ems on its technology implementation the uh, the emergency management system ambulance system and he is a corresponding member he was also corresponding member of the indian road congress h8 committee on urban roads from 1517 with this i will welcome uh, geeta to talk about improving road safety uh, data driven analysis to improve road safety thanks so today i'll talk about uh, data driven analysis to improve road safety right and uh, i'll give a brief motivation it is not a topic that deserves motivation we all know uh, it's a major epidemic in our country right some of you may not know the actual numbers maybe i'll share and then you will realize why and uh, then i'll talk about a couple of research studies that we've done recently uh, you know we've done more work but this gives you the flavor and uh, if required you know we can of course discuss more we can take questions as well right okay so the ministry of road transport and highways uh, is the apex body that looks after road safety in the country right so they have a nice dashboard and uh, when you go look at this dashboard right uh, this is how things look right does this thing work or okay so what we see here you know <coughs> different uh, statistics total road accidents road accident per lakh population per 10000 vehicles and so on right so all of these seem to be having a nice downward trend okay but if you look at absolute numbers okay number of persons killed in road accidents you can see there has been a steady increase right the last uh, you know few data points here things seem to have kind of stabilized but it's somewhere around this number okay so about 1.5 lakh people die on our roads every year all right so you know that's the size of a small town okay so every year a small town is disappearing in the country because of road accidents that is how critical the situation is all right so <coughs> there are also these nice colorful maps that you see all right so in this particular map if you see there is only one state which is green and that's tamil nadu right so this graph tells you how things have changed between the previous year i think the two years compared year is 2017 and 2018 right so every state in the country every union territory in the country has continuously increasing numbers okay so tamil nadu is the only state where numbers have 
reduced. Okay. Any guesses why? Huh? I'm sorry. We don't reach high enough speeds. On the contrary, Tamil Nadu was one of the first states to build, you know, highways to international standards, connecting all districts. Right? We have high speeds here. So, as a result, what? Okay, one of the statistics is Tamil Nadu has the highest number of road accidents in the country. Okay, so we are doing so poorly, we had to come down at some point. Right? Only way to go, Only way to go was down. Right? Exactly. <laughs> right? So, opposite of what you were just saying. Okay, so that's one reason. Anyway, I mean, it's a serious topic, jokes apart. Ten years back, right, in 20, uh, 2008, Tamil Nadu was the first state in the country to formally set up a road accident database management system called RADMS, right? So this was, this was with World Bank funding. So this was way back in 2008, this was launched, okay? Do you know when the next road accident database management system was launched? in the country, in which state and when? Any guesses? 2008, Tamil Nadu did it. Right? Sometime in 2019, right? I think Rajasthan said, okay, we also need a road accident database management system. Right? So, Tamil Nadu was 11 years ahead, you know, in the curve. Okay? So, all the other states are red, right? Because they're not doing any analysis. They're not really acting on it. Okay, Tamil Nadu became green, of course, one reason, it had a high base, but also because it started collecting data a long time back, they were at least collecting data. They were not doing much with it for a long time, right? But that's how it started, okay? So, you know, that's something for us to look at, right? So this is again some statistics, you know, I've been, uh, you know, recently I gave the same talk, you know, at uh, ADB workshop. And I realized I had statistics from 2011, right? So that is when I first made this statistics slide. Then I said I need to update it, okay? And when I updated it, I found nothing much changed. <laughs> Things were as bad as it was in 2011, right? In some cases, it became worse. Okay? Some other things, you know, just to highlight, we are in Chennai, right? If you look at Chennai, in 2011, they had over 1,000 fatalities every year, right? Every year, 1,000 people are dying on our... Chennai roads, okay? And in 2021, the number was close to 1,000, right? So again, it looks like we've not really done much, okay? And uh, if you look at who dies on the roads, 70% of these are two-wheeler riders and pedestrians, right? Just like that, walking on the road one day and next moment, people are gone, all right? for no mistake of this, okay? We call them vulnerable road users. People on the cars, they have seat belts, they have airbags. People on the road walking, they have nothing, all right? So we need to pay attention to that. And again, 2021, just breaking down those numbers, 42% are two-wheeler riders, 25% are pedestrians, right? So again, close to 70%, all right? So we really need to pay attention to this group and do something about it, okay? And uh, you know, if you walk outside IIT, we know we really don't care about these people, all right? So just outside IIT gate, you have a footpath, right? Somebody took it literally. Footpath means one foot wide path, right? That's all they provided, okay? Really sad. Yeah, but 2020 was more the pandemic. 2021 things that again, you know, come back to people are pretty much traveling. You had waves, but you know people are still traveling, right? So not as much an impact in 2021. 2020, yes, huge reduction across the country, right? So that's a year we can't even consider, right? Okay. So it required a pandemic to stop an epidemic, right? I use that sometimes. Right? So I'll talk about a couple of research topics that we've done, right? Uh, one is looking at uh, you know two-wheeler crashes at what we call as mid-block road sections, right? So if you look at a road network, you have intersections, and the road connecting these two intersections is what we call as a mid-block, 
right? So the characteristics of accidents that happen at mid-block are different from what happens at intersections, right? So in this, we looked at specifically two-wheeler riders because we saw they are vulnerable and a lot of accidents involving two-wheeler riders. So this is just again a uh, distribution of you know uh, accidents and this is in particular Chennai South, the area we are from, right? And uh, this is a few months in 2018, right? So you can see the graph on the left is fatal, the one on the right is for non-fatal. Things are not very different, okay? So two-wheelers, pedestrians, all of these guys are, you know, the ones who are maximum involved. Okay. So, uh, right, so if you look at it, whether it's fatal or non-fatal, quite a bit of, you know, vulnerable road users are involved, right? So people on cars, right, they're a minority. Of course, the car, uh, you know, population is also less, right? Therefore, you know, the moral is, we need to look at two-wheeler riders in particular. What's happening to two-wheeler riders? How can we improve safety of two-wheeler riders, right? Okay. So we looked at uh, you know a couple of uh, you know models here: random forest, sea forest, and right. So the area of road safety is five six decades old, right? And traditionally, we've been using statistical you know models, right? What we call as econometric models for analyzing these, right? Uh, only recently, over the last you know ten years or so, people have started looking at how can we use ML models as well to analyze road safety, right? So one of the reasons is, of course, uh, you know, the emphasis has been more on uh, understanding, explaining things, right? Coming up with qualitative insights and econometric models were considered to be good, right? To give you uh, workable insights, right? But uh, when you are looking at, of course, uh, you know, prediction accuracy and so on, ML models have been beating these econometric models hands down. So people have started looking at these as well. and. I'll talk about it later that, you know, we can bring interpretability even into ML models, right? So that's something uh, a lot of people are working on, right? And we'll compare these with what we call as ordered probit model, which is one of the traditional statistical models, right? And uh, idea is again to identify what variables affect injury severity, right? By injury severity, we mean did the accident become fatal or was it a grievous injury or was it a simple injury, right? So we are having a three-level classification here, which is what we are modeling. Okay. So we used uh, data from uh, the road accident database management system, the one that Tamunadu has been uh, Tamunadu has been collecting for a long time, right? And uh, we looked at the Chennai district in particular, and we found in that particular year there are about 3,400 motorized two-wheeler accident records, right? And you know the map on the left is kind of giving you the heat map where the accidents are, you know, more concentrated, right? So you can see that uh, you know the arterial roads your Mount Road or Anna Salai or GST Road, right? So that's most of the time in red, right? All this is part of that. Okay, and then you also see these stretches, right? So this is your OMR, right? So that that is also in red, right? And then there are some pockets as well, you know, where you have more accidents that happen, right? So that one of that is Inner Ring Road. What you see here is the Inner Ring Road or Jawaharlal Nehru Road, right? That also has a lot of accidents. So we are Modeling injury severity at four levels here. Fatal, grievous, simple, and non-injury, right? And uh, we use several different variables, okay? The uh, database system itself was over-designed. They had about 150 fields in which people had to enter data, okay? So uh, initially, for the first two to three years, there was hardly, you know, 5% of the data was being filled. All right, because people are just so overwhelmed to see this huge form they have to fill, right? And in those days, they had dial-up internet connections, right? So a police station somewhere, you know, in the remote part of Tamil Nadu will be dialing up, uploading this data, right? And if the connection breaks, right, then he has to fill the whole thing again, <laughs> okay? This is how things were, right? I mean, this is just a decade back. We've come a long way, right? But uh, data was very poor, okay? So though they had 150 data points, fields, Right? We couldn't use all of them. And uh, some of them, what they will do, they'll just pick the first option. Right? Because the drop-down menu had 30, 40 options. Right? They just didn't have the patience to go and find out what is the right option and pick it. They just used to pick. Right? So we used to wonder why is this happening all the time in all accidents? And then when we went to see the database, how they fill it, that was the first option in the database. Right? So these kind of fields 
we obviously dropped it, right? But there's also a lesson, you know, on how you design these systems. If you over design, right, you need to understand who is going to use it, what conditions are they using it, how are they going to fill it, right? And then think about how to design it. If you go and design this perfect system, people may not use it, right? So a um, lot of the fields were discarded, but there are, you know, still a handful of them that is useful, like collision type, what type of road category, the time of the accident, the age of the driver, whether whether or not there is a median, right, or a traffic police in the vicinity, uh, what about the road visibility, right, and uh, what is the other vehicle with whom the two-wheeler collided, right, all of these, you know, were fairly dependable, which we used, right. So we developed, like I said, uh, three different sets of models to do the comparison. Okay. So this is what we found, you know, again, right, when it comes to any of these accuracy measures, machine learning models outperform you know, traditional statistical models, that's what we saw. And between the random forest and sea forest is a conditional forest, right? Between these two, the sea forest uh, performed better, right? Uh, the importance is always what we are finally interested in, right? What factors are causing more severe accidents? If you understand this better, then we can come up with suitable interventions. So here, you know, uh, it's very, very clear, okay? If you're riding a two-wheeler, move away if a large vehicle comes in front of you, right? Because if you hit a large vehicle, chances are you will be seriously injured, right? That's what this tells us, okay? After the size of the vehicle, what matters is the collision type. Was the collision head-on? Was the collision side-on, all right? Or was it, you know, self-fall, right? A few categories that are there. So these things matter. Then comes the age of driver, right? So generally what happens, the younger drivers seem to manage to not get seriously injured. The older drivers seem to be the ones who are more likely to get, you know, grievously injured, right? And uh, a few other factors, right? So this was consistent across the different, you know, modeling models that we had developed. Okay, so this is with random forest, right? A couple of things changed in terms of order, but collision type and colliding vehicle, this you know, is the most important factor, right? And uh, so one of the things that we interpreted from this particular study was we said, if you really want to save the lives of two-wheeler riders, right, or prevent them from getting grievously injured, perhaps we should think about segregating, right, the two-wheeler riders from the rest of the traffic, okay? So that is one sure shot way of significantly reducing two-wheeler, you know, injury severity, okay? So that was one interpretation that uh, we came up with. And recently, last week, you know, Sridhar mentioned how I'm constantly pulled into these meetings, right? So I was at one such meeting in which they were actually discussing, is it feasible, uh, right? So uh, so people are thinking about it, okay? So that's uh, the first model that uh, you know, I just wanted to talk about research. The second uh, topic I will talk about is on uh, comparing, again, statistical and machine learning models, right? Again, we look at motorcycle crash injury severity. But in this study, we went slightly bigger in terms of scope. We looked at the entire state of Tamil Nadu, right? And uh, we looked at highways as well. And uh, we also started looking at more from inter you know, interpretability uh, perspective, right? And we also said, can we look at interactions, right? Not only look at one variable's impact, but look at interactions of two variables, right? And see how that is impacting, you know, uh, the injury severity, okay? So this is joint work with my former MS student, Rahul. Okay. Again, this is just uh, why should we look at it, right? So we saw Chennai, there are quite a number of two-wheeler accidents. The same is true even when you look at it statewide, right? And uh, interestingly, right, if you look at this graph at the bottom, this is telling us about uh, 60 plus percent of accidents or road traffic deaths are occurring in our national highway and state highway. Right, and if you look at what is the length of state highway and national highway, they are hardly you know few percentage. That's the length of state highway and national highway, right? But they account for almost sixty percent of traffic deaths, right? So we need to pay spe uh, special attention to the highways, right? And uh, yeah, so that's what it's telling us, right? It's only about five percent, okay? And that's accounting for sixty percent of fatalities. 
why do we do ml models you know uh, there is always this debate especially in the road safety literature because the tradition is to do you know more econometric modeling or you know statistical modeling right uh, so one thing is of course there is minimal assumption about data right uh, you don't have to make any distributional assumptions right and uh, when you have a lot of imbalanced data right these ml models seem to do better right and you can also handle large data sets some of these other models take a long time you know to estimate parameters if you have large data sets right and uh, even when you have noise these models seem to work fairly better whereas traditional models if you add some noise it can start giving you you know results that are not robust right uh, i won't talk about this last part uh, but one of the things that we did also is using uh, you know ml techniques identifying if there is noise in the data all right and then correcting for the noise and then going and uh, estimating you know uh, ml models for severity right so that's something that we've done as well but uh, today i will not talk about it uh, because of time okay so again data is from the road accident database management system right and uh, we've taken the accidents from the year 2017 right and we looked at uh, accidents in national highway and state highways right and uh, we had about 10000 data points right and if you look at the distribution of injury severity right so fatal is about 12% grievous injury is about 11 right minor injury is about 58% and uh, no injury is about 19% right and if you ask me is that reflective of the accidents that are happening in the ground not really okay so when you have a fatal injury the law requires it has to be recorded right you have to record every fatal accident because finally you know it becomes a police case fir has to be filed right whereas if it's a no injury right half the time you know people just exchange some currency notes and then they just leave right they don't really report to the police so most of the accidents are actually no injury but they don't get recorded okay so this is not representative of actual accidents but it's more about recorded accidents right so we have to do some pre processing we have to do some cleaning with the data right and then we have to pick models that we are going to develop as well as performance measures i'll briefly talk about that as well here right and then we do the training and prediction and finally do interpretations right so what is cleaning of data set you know uh, like i said there is somebody out there remotely entering this data into the database quite often they'll make mistakes right and if they make mistakes randomly it's very easy to find it out right so suppose they say it's a you know uh fir is filed under ipc section uh, uh i think it's 304 all right that means it's a fatal accident but if suppose they say no fatality so clearly they made a mistake somewhere all right so these kind of things we'll be able to uh, yeah identify right and other things like you know sometimes the latitude longitude is wrongly marked right suddenly you find an accident happened in bay of bengal all right but we are not really monitoring ship accidents it's just that somewhere while entering the data right they messed up right and literally they enter digit by digit right we're talking about 13.71654 80.12346 and so on right so somebody instead of doing 80 if they put 83 you land up in you know the bay of bengal right so those kind of errors you know need to be cleaned right so after cleaning we lost about 10% of the data set right so that's how much errors that were there uh, that's a reasonable number we still have a fairly large data set we could work with all right and uh, in order to look at the performance measures instead of looking at traditional measures like precision accuracy and so on right we looked at something called as uh, matthews correlation coefficient all right so there are a few advantages of the advantages of this right so the mcc can identify if you're just classifying at random all right if you equally say everything is probable you will still get a fn score of 0.5 right but mcc will say you know what you're just randomly guessing i'm not going to give you any score for that right you get a zero for that okay similarly mcc can you know indicate uh, when one of the classes is not predicted right so for example here this particular category is not at all predicted you still get a fn score of 0.97 right so that's because most of the data points lie here there are very few here if you don't predict it it says that's fine all right so mcc will say you know i can't even define this you've done absolutely no prediction you know you've just said everything belongs to one category not the other right so these are issues with some of the traditional measures similarly you know it's class invariant right so if you flip things 
if I'm doing a bi binary classification, if I flip, then your F1 score can flip, right, can change. Whereas MCC will be invariant, right, it will give you the same result no matter what. Right? So for these reasons, you know, we said perhaps MCC is a better measure that we can use for comparing, right. So I have another few minutes. We started a bit late, right. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, we split the data set 80-20, right, and we trained uh, uh, random forest, GBMs, logistic regression, right. Uh, we just did some randomized grid search for hyperparameter tuning, right, and uh, yeah, we look at both MCC and F1 values to compare the models. Okay. So, uh, we talked about interpretability, right? So one of the things that uh, machine learning models have been criticized for is we can't really interpret things, right? We can't really get very specific quantitative, you know, uh, measures if I want, okay? Which you get, for example, if you had an econometric model, I can always calculate what are called as elasticities, right? And then compare elasticities to say, what variable is having more impact and what variable is having less impact and so on, right? So whereas in ML, it's not, obvious, but there are ways you can do it, right? So here are a few things. Variable importance is fairly common, right? But still, the variable importance only gives you, you know, some kind of a qualitative measure, right? It doesn't give you, for example, the direction of effect, right? Is it positively impacting or negatively impacting whatever you're looking to measure, right? You can't get elasticities, right? And also, it doesn't capture variation within group, okay? So if you have uh, a particular variable with different categories, how things vary within the group is something that, you know, we don't capture when you do variable importance, right? The PDP, on the other hand, can at least give us the direction of effect as well as elasticities, right? And then there is something called as ice plots, which can give you all three, right? So we'll just see quick examples of these and we'll use this to interpret, you know, uh, the model results. In terms of uh, performance, you know, interestingly here, uh, we didn't see too much of a difference between your traditional logistic model as well uh, compared to the ML models, right? But on the test set, you know, the difference was much more narrower, right? But the MCC value was higher for random forest, right, as compared to others, while the F1 score actually was better for logistic regression, right? And again, uh, these econometric models are known uh, to favor one particular category which has high representation in the data set, right? So it gives you a higher value of, you know, fit or you know any score uh, accuracy scores if one if you have severe imbalance right so that's what is getting reflected there right mcc is reasonably neutral to that okay so we can say that you know maybe random forest is performing better if you start comparing with respect to mcc in the test set right so how can we interpret this so first uh, we're looking at some uh, ice plots here right so this is the effect of colliding vehicle type right so one vehicle is, of course, a two-wheeler. What is the other vehicle? Okay. So what we have here is we have four graphs within this, right? The first graph here in the lower right is for no injury category, right? Then you have minor, grievous, and fatal, right? So what you find in the no injury category is if the two-wheeler collides with the cycle, there's a very high probability that you'll end up with no injury, right? Whereas if you end up colliding with a heavy motor vehicle, right, chances are very slim you will come out unscathed, right? On the other hand, if it's a, you know, heavy vehicle, right, you can see the probability of a fatal injury is much higher compared to the other vehicle types, right? So we are able to, you know, quantify what these effects are, right? We can even say how much more likely you're going to end up with a more uh, severe injury if you meet with an accident with a heavy uh, motor vehicle, right? So this is something that you couldn't do with the variable importance plots. Right, so you can do that with the ice plots. Okay. Similarly, looking at uh, the presence of shoulders. Okay. Uh, shoulders are basically the paved part on the edge of your highway, on the either side of the highway. Right. So typically, you would have either a paved shoulder or an unpaved shoulder. Right. So it'll be for a meter or so, and then you'll have you know all the other things like vegetation, and you'll have the rainwater pit and all that. Right. So if you look at presence of shoulders. Right, that also has an impact. Okay, the probability of uh, crash resulting in fatal injury is more when the shoulder is unpaved compared to a paved shoulder. Okay, so if you have highways with unpaved shoulder, one way to reduce fatalities in those highways is pave 
those shoulders, right? Of course, it costs money, but it will save lives, right? So you have to look at the benefit versus, you know, the cost, right? And uh, so those are, yeah. So this is the fatal accident on the of the two wheeler rider. We are talking about fatalities of the two wheeler rider. So that's the other vehicle I'm not considering here, right? Of course, the uh, two wheeler riders can hit other vehicle and cause a fatality of others as well, right? Uh, you see here, two wheelers also there. So the colliding vehicle is a two wheeler. I am in a two wheeler. I hit another two wheeler, and I ended up with you know a fatal or a grievous. That's possible as well, right? But you are only focusing on two wheelers fatality. Right. So the previous graph had you know, discrete variables. So here we are doing the same ice plots for a continuous variable. Right. We are looking at the age of the two-wheeler rider. Right. So you can see, you know, uh, relationship is fairly non-linear. But this particular graph, if you see, beyond the age of 60, right, suddenly things go up. Right. So if you are over 60, right, I think nobody in this room is. But uh, if you have somebody who is over 60, if they say, I'll go on a two-wheeler, ask them to be careful, right? Because if they end up in an accident, they are much more likely to end up being grievously injured or fatally injured, right? And uh, similarly, the effect of the age of the colliding vehicle driver, right, is also important, right? So here too, you know, interestingly, as, you know, the uh, age increases, the no injury probability seems to increase, right? That means older drivers are less likely to cause fatal accidents. Right? It's the younger guys you know who are causing. So if you are driving a two-wheeler, please be careful. Right? You hit somebody, you're likely to cause you know fatal accidents, injuries. Similarly, you know, uh, this is PDP, partial dependence plots. Right? So we're talking again two-way interactions here. Right? So earlier we talked about impact of one variable on severity. Here I'm talking about two variables taken together. How does that impact severity? Right? So uh, the probability is now. Uh, color coded as a heat map. Okay, so what you again see here is paved versus unpaved, different vehicle types, right? So you can see that if I end up hitting a heavy vehicle, right, and if the shoulder is paved, then the probability that I'll have a fatal injury is lower. It's darker here as opposed to an unpaved shoulder, right? So I can get these kind of interaction effects to further tease out what is happening. Right? We already saw having a paved shoulder is good. Right? Now I'm saying having a paved shoulder is good, especially where you have a lot of heavy vehicles and two wheelers you know, moving together. So if you had a decision to make, where do I invest? Where do I build a paved shoulder? Right? Then I'll ask, which of those two locations do you have more interactions with heavy vehicles and two wheeler riders? That's a place you would like to invest first before investing in others. Right? So these kind of insights we'll be able to draw from uh, you know, these results. So similarly for a continuous case as well, right? So yeah, so summary of some of these interpretations, right? What are the things that are highly influencing, right? So colliding vehicle type, whether or not there is a divider, whether or not there is a shoulder, all of these are very important, all right? And uh, if you look at the bivariate, two take, taken two at a time, the colliding vehicle type interacting with shoulder type and central divider, that was important. And then the colliding vehicle type also interacting with the age of the two-wheeler rider, that also makes uh, you know, some important, right? So, yeah, the gender or, you know, weather and all that really didn't have much of an impact, right? Partly it could be because uh, not enough women are driving two-wheelers, right? So, they're still in the minority, right? That will change, right? And data will change, you know, interpretations will change over time. So, some of the uh, conclusions that we draw from this, you know, uh, we say MCC perhaps is a better measure that you could use to compare, right? And, uh, you know, colliding vehicle type continues to be the most influential variable. So segregating, you know, two wheelers from other vehicle types will give you the best result, right? And uh, yeah, anger drivers tend to be more aggressive. So perhaps some education, telling them how unsafe it is will help, right? So policy implications, you could have separate lanes, educate the youth and so on. Right? So this is how you take data, you build models, you interpret, give policy recommendations. I think I'll stop there and if there are questions, I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you.